just, I was just thinking the other day, you know, our, our site at Broughton, we're really quite near to the Cotswolds. And when English people think about Cotswolds, they think about cream teas, pretty villages and all the rest of it. But prior to the Romans arriving, the Cotswolds was part of a sort of geological map of the landscape. And I know you're very keen on a landscape approach. How do you cope with big structures like rivers, hills, ridges, things like that in that central area of Oxfordshire? How do we begin to understand the pre-Roman landscape? <laughs> that's, a, that's a big question to start the day, isn't it, Tim? Uh, well, you, you have to take the overview. You, you almost have to think a little bit like a parachute is jumping out of an aeroplane. You know, you, you leap out and, and as you as you descend, you see the landscape below you, you know, and hopefully you'll find somewhere nice and comfortable to land. But you have to take an overview first, which is not, not to get sucked into any detail. You First of all, you can use thing, the Ordnance Survey maps, have a look at the topography is always the where you start. Geology and topography, what, what is the land like? Because in essence, when we when we're dealing with landscape, which has been settled and occupied three, four, five thousand years, we have to go back to that period in time. You know, there's no motorways, there's no airports, <laughs> there's none of that. You're dealing with a physical landscape. How did people deal with a physical landscape? So you have to put yourself into that mindset. Um, some geologies are better than others for, for growing crops. Some are boggy, you can't settle in. Woodland's difficult to penetrate, it's got to be cut down and so on. So the starting point is always to look at um, what resources might be in an area, where there might be minerals that can be mined, um, gold, silver, lead, all that sort of thing. Uh, like one of the reasons the Romans came to this country was to, you know, was to get hold of minerals. Um, you've got to think about the importance of river valleys, which we know in the very early prehistoric periods are in, in, in essence the main route ways through through the uh, countryside. When you rip it, take everything else out and look at the basic rivers of Britain you can get a long way into the middle of Britain from the Bristol Channel coming up to Severn. You've then got the Trent coming down from Nottingham and of mm -hmm. course you've got the Thames rolling up virtually to Cirencester. And these yeah. are reasonably navigatable uh, parts of the landscape. Indeed, I mean, we've even got you know, if you think to the um, to the Viking and Saxon period, when when you have incursions up the Severn and the River Ouse, right in the Trent, right into the heart of the to the you know, to central Britain, effectively. So, uh, we, I mean, we do know from from understanding early cultures that river valleys are are the main arteries of the of, of the uh, navigation and, and people would navigate their way up river valleys, they would use local uh, well pronounced landmarks, hilltops, um, geological outcrops, all these things. Pe people have an inherent understanding of their landscape in the early periods and, and so that's where you start. You create in effect a map of the geography and the geology, try and understand what that's telling you before you even start thinking about uh, uh, about building anything what what would you do if you were parachuted down into that landscape and you you had to try and penetrate somewhere would you would you try and climb over every steep ridge that you could or would you take a nice gentle gradient a river could take you up i know which i'd go for and talking about ridges um we're, we're in that central Oxford region, which is a bit like a triangle, Banbury, the lower left. Those cots, that ridge of Cotswold limestone carries on fairly far up the country and you then get ironstones appearing. It's a sort of, um, what do they call it? The Corallian Ridge. I'm not sure mm, what that means. That's right, yes. You might like well, to explain that in a minute. It's sort of a, lime, a limestone, effectively a limestone term, yeah. Yeah. Coral. <laughs> yeah, a, a, a Korea, so a sea bed feature, really. And there's mm -hmm. a ridge there, and along the bottom, you've got the Chilterns, which is a similar ridge. 
is and and some people have suggested that there's a sort of prehistoric route going across Britain, effectively heading up towards Lincoln, which mm -hmm. effectively follows these ridges. Um, and that those some of those routes existed. What's your what's your feeling about that sort of prehistoric trackway, I suppose, sort of idea? Well, again, yeah, I mean, we know in, in other parts of the country there are ridgeway routes and there are often quite, quite important monuments along the ridgeway routes. There are benign ways of crossing these, these big ridges that you get in, in that part of the world. Uh, obviously, what we don't have a full understanding of today is the amount of woodland that existed on some of these ridgeways and so on. But we're, they are a fundamental part of the arterial movement across the countryside. And most of those ridgeway routes offer a fairly benign way of crossing countryside because the geology will take you in certain directions. Um, it, it stops you having to climb up and down things if you can walk along the top of a ridge. Then you have to cross the river valleys and use the river valleys to go the next bit and so on. It, it all fits back into this pattern of, of understanding movement and how you can how you can best use the natural topography to make your life easier to get through and and exploit the resources that are in that landscape itself. And it would be quite an interesting exercise to actually walk some of these current ridgeways. I don't think I don't think I don't know if there's a Cotswold way. But certainly when you're up the top there, there's sort of Wales to the west if you're heading north. Uh, and you can look down onto the what you might call the Oxfordshire Plain, where you've got the clays that will eventually make the Oxfordshire pottery industries. And at mm -hmm. some point you keep going. And it's interesting when the Romans arrive, the Foss Way, that key route between Exeter and Lincoln, um, tends to follow that that sort of angular ridge to the left mm -hmm. is Wales to the right and that the Romans come and there's an imposition of a route way originally by the militaries and where we are is the Foss Way, Watling Street and Aikman Street, a triangle of these and we're sort of in the middle and some maps I've seen sort of show to the west of the Fosway, sort of there be dangers. The <laughs> tribes over there aren't quite so friendly. The Cornavai, um, maybe bits of the Dobunai, but these early boundaries in the Iron Age actually became a meeting place for all those tribes. Mm, mm. Well, I think that's, I mean, that's an important aspect of, of trying to understand uh, Roman society and where Roman villas are and Roman towns and, and, and all that part of, uh, of the settlement of Roman Britain because a lot of the places that the Romans establish in the landscape are already pre-existing tribal centres. They're already pre-existing farmsteads. This, this landscape, particularly in Oxfordshire, is, is well populated before the Romans get here. Many examples of Iron Age settlements and field systems exist on the on the better soils you have networks of roads in this landscape long before the romans ever get here as well there are many settlements that have shown up in the the uh, the thames valley gravels areas which show trackways and settlements along the trackways this is all part all in the landscape remember before the romans come and build these big military roads you have uh, Iron Age hill forts, which are, are often at the, uh, the center of these tribal areas, or they're around the perimeters. And they are fixed points in the landscape that the Romans are trying to impose themselves into as well. So as well as understanding the natural geography, the geology, what resources it can offer, what the soils can offer in terms of crops and grazing and all that sort of thing, because you need those resources to sustain the Roman military and then settlement. You've also got to start to put on your map, as it were, on top of the geology, you've got to start to put the map of what's already there when the Romans arrived and see how they fit into that. Uh, and you're quite right, what you will see in, in various parts of the, the country 
is that a lot of the Roman roads that we all know the names of and we've seen the maps of Roman Britain with them on, in part they are re-established on what we suspect are earlier routes and ridgeways which link together lots of these settlements in particularly in, in the Oxfordshire area. Yeah I think it would be quite an interesting exercise to plot the big Iron Age fort centres in that area and see how they relate. Um, and the other interesting thing that I came across was that basically maps have been made of the distribution of Iron Age coins. Um, and, and by and large, that's how the location of the various tribes, the Catavalloni, the Dobwini, the Atribates, they had a coin culture and the coin culture, the implication is the coin culture was quite localized. So the Dobb and I had their own coins mm. and there was obviously some form of exchange, but it appears that the coinage is quite clearly scattered in what is taken to be um, the location of those tribes. And when you think of um, these tribes that have senior chieftains, dominating huge areas of the landscape based in hill forts and that was all there and active uh, before the Romans turned up. That's right, oh, it's interesting. It, it is interesting that because um, this cultural identity that you get in different with different tribes in different parts of the country of course th this is what you've got to think of on as you're building up your map as well when you're trying to understand the place is that uh, what are the boundaries of these territories and these cultures? And they often are natural river valleys. And if you look at the placement of hill forts, they will often start to point in that direction. Um, so that when the Roman cultures are then imposed on that, what you're trying to understand when you look at Roman villas, it's not just a dot where the villa is, it's what are the estate boundaries around the villas? particularly the very large ones um, in the later centuries when they probably contain thousands and thousands of acres. Are their boundaries new boundaries or are their boundaries re respecting the boundaries of the, of the Iron Age populations? And so you keep having to piece all this together. Um, when I think of those big landscapes, the Cotswolds, the Chilterns, the rivers and things, have you seen a 3D model that's that, in a way, that big, that takes in a landscape? That how, how do we see it? How do we show people and let them visualise what it is? Well, it's actually, it's actually less complicated than, than you might think, Tim. The, uh, the, the digital world has given us all sorts of wonderful toys to play with these days. Uh, and, and if you've got a computer, you can easily access them. There are many 3D data sets of the topography, i.e. it's like a, you know, like a three, 3D model in, in computer data. And you can easily translate that into 3D modeling software, which allows you to, to build that on your own computer. I mean, you can do this sort of stuff at, at home relatively easily, but the... Um, the Ordnance Survey, for instance, who you know the, the people who map the country, they provide this topographic data, and you you can you can get hold of it very easily, and you can build up your own three D models, and mm. there are various packages that you you can do it with, most of I which are, I, are free. And I quite like the idea. I think it was Plymouth, uh, a university down in Plymouth. Um, down there had got a project for kids where they invited them to build the landscape of their local villages with papier mache and plasticine, mm. and sort of make a model out of clay of the landscape yeah. using scales and things like that, which I always thought was yeah. nice. Of it. I, a, fr a friend of mine did something similar. I must tell you about this. Um, he, when he was a child and he, when he grew up, he became an archaeologist. But one of the things he did as a child was to, you know, the contours on an Ordnance Survey map. Yeah. Well, what he, what he did was uh, cut out cornflake packets and cut them to the same shape as the contours and, and stuck them on and built his own mountains out of cornflake packets. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we should have a shot at that. <laughs> okay Stuart well thank you very much lovely to talk to you and um, very good news things are progressing really well 
looking forward to it. I might get some new gaffer tape by then for my webcam too. Yes, that, that, we'd appreciate <laughs> that because I've, I've, I've been looking at your chin mainly. So, okay, Stuart, thank you very much. Time Team is back. The iconic show returns to film two brand new excavations, a huge Roman villa in Oxfordshire and an Iron Age settlement in Cornwall with underground tunnels known locally as the Fugu. We've already taken you behind the scenes here and on Patreon, and the programmes are currently in post-production, coming to this channel in spring. So please subscribe to this channel and press the notification bell to ensure you catch up with all the latest updates. To ensure you catch all the latest updates, please do subscribe to this channel, follow us on social media, sign up to our newsletter and join us on Patreon.